Uh, many thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm conscious that we're running a little bit late, but for uh, those who have stayed and for the, um, we've got such a great panel here, hopefully it will be indulged so we can have sort of at least, uh, it's five to five now, so we have at least 20 minutes of this, so go on to podcast five, that would be great. Uh, my name is Robert Kiley. I head up the um, research team at the Welcome, and as you probably know, Welcome is a sort of research funder in this space. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to stop talking. So what I really want to do is is ask our panel a few questions. Then really what I want is for for you lot to, to ask some questions. Before I do that, I just think we've got a really great selection of, of talks this afternoon. Uh, I think I think you organised these. Some you know, really congratulating on the, the great work she's done of pulling this this panel together. So thank you very much for that. Um, so let me just ask each of two of the panellists you've already met by their presentations and two you haven't. So let me start with Paul. Perhaps just very quickly, just introduce yourselves and I think to establish our credibility with, the, um, with our audience, perhaps we could just explain or demonstrate how we ourselves are living the principles of FAIR. Paul, <laughs> over to you. Okay, thanks Robert. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Ayres, I'm Pro Vice Provost uh, in UCL, University College London. Uh, uh, in that role, I am responsible for our, our, our library service, but I'm also responsible for introducing open science practices and principles across the institution, so not just in the library, but ac across uh, all uh, academic and administrative uh, departments as well. So how, how do I live the life there? Um, well, I uh, and my team uh, led the Learn project, which is an EU-funded project looking at advocacy for proper research data management um, activities. When we, we produce a number of uh, case studies and a final report, um, identifying with open data what what was the way that um, we felt researchers wanted to travel when they were looking at. The impacts and benefits that research data, proper research data management, uh, could bring. Um, in my day-to-day -day life in um, UCL, I'm leading our research repository project. So I'm the academic champion for that. We are creating a new platform in UCL for curating and archiving research data for the for the long term for uh, for academics who want to. Uh, meet funder requirements or make their data available for sharing and reuse and we're just about to go live with that platform in um, uh, November, so we're going live then. Uh, the challenge is to engage with all our academic colleagues across all 11 schools and faculties, some of which have a very strongly developed culture of sharing and openness who could easily embrace and willingly embrace research data principles and open uh, data principles. And then other colleagues were not yet quite so enlightened, and I include my own um, subject area history in, in that uh, category. Share it, we don't have a, I'm a um, 16th century historian um, in my other life, and we don't have a culture of sharing. And some of the points the last speaker made about lack of reciprocity would be the main reason why historians hate sharing, because it's a, it's a one-way traffic and they feel they've lost the advantage. OK, we, we'll come back to that. OK. Susanna. So very briefly, well, you already heard me talking. So I'm an associate professor at the engineering department of the University of Oxford. I'm also a co-director of the Oxford D Research Centre. Well, FAIR, it's one of the half they wear. And it's always been a blessing and a curse, you know, once you are one of the fair initiator, you know, and, 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 and the neighbor, it's a hat you can't remove. And obviously, it's, it's what I follow, it's what I always done, to really honestly see the, see the thing, fair, it's a new name for something we were all doing. I used to work at the European Bioinformatic Institute, I always done data discovery, taxes, you know, um, data sharing, data interoperability, now it's a new name for it. So beside, uh, you know, being active in, in many projects and so as a research activity, my team developed two model methods that enable uh, fair and fairness. 
Uh, I also, um, as part of my new role as a faculty at the university, I start to introduce um, courses on data readiness. Nobody liked fair data because they didn't know what it was. But the moment I use a word that a colleague from actually uh, Amazon Research use, and he, he has a paper on data readiness, um, for machine learning, everybody understands what data readiness means apparently. So, in introducing course, it's something I want to try to do more at university, progressive for undergrad and, and postgrad, because you know it's important to train the new generation in, in what making data fairly means and what they can do and the role they can play. Because you know, research data management or fair data it's also a career path, and we should enable that too. Thank you. Adam? Okay, thank you, Robert. As I told you already, they've heard a lot from me today, so I'll be very quick. In my own um, discipline life, I'm fortunate to uh, be able to publish in the journals of the International Union of Crystallography, which I think uh, we've already heard a lot about um, how we publish our data and make it uh, fair, um, just by dint of being crystallographers. Uh, but what I would say is that I have continued to support those journals even when the incentives have been other in terms of where you know, perhaps uh, REF would like us to publish and so on. So that's one way I think in which I've shown my credentials, if you like. But also in terms of my Pro Vice Chancellor role, I'll be doing very much uh, what you just mentioned about um, trying to engage the other faculties mm -hmm. that are, are, are less inclined. Henry? Well, I'm a jobbing research chemist. I've been doing that for 40 years now. Um, but unlike Charles, who you heard from earlier, I don't make molecules, but I generate data about molecules, um, either on the computer or extracting it from instruments. So for 40 years, uh, we've had lots of data. 40 years ago, we didn't have much of a clue as to how to preserve it for uh, future generations. But the wonderful JISC organisation that we've heard about today, in the days when they actually used to fund money to do projects, and um, 13 years ago funded Peter and I to explore the properties of a data repository at a time when not many people were doing that. Um, and that has completely changed my jobbing career as a research chemist. Um, I very rapidly realised that the two concepts of generating data about molecules and preserving it were absolutely joined at the hip. They were inseparable. It became an essential tool for me 13 years ago and it remains an essential tool for me now. I couldn't imagine doing one of the jobs without having access to the other. Um, if you want to look at some examples of this, um, in recent years I've taken some of the more adventurous occasionally controversial thoughts which you can't publish in the journals and I've been putting them on a blog which is a, a great liberating experience. Um, those of you presumably who know about a DOI, everybody's heard of DOIs, I can just quote two of them at you. There are only four letters each and so if you wish you can make um, a note of them now. Uh, but there's many more on Charles's poster downstairs if you want to capture them. Uh, the two DOIs, I'll read them out, CTJC that's the first, and CTJD. Um, and you should be able to get um, examples of what we consider, or what I especially, those are blog entries, and so I should personalise it. Those are, do you want me to do it again? Did you catch that? No, I've got them. I've got them. Um, so those, those are two very, very recent, a uh, few weeks old examples of what I and, and the people I work with think of as fair data. Thank you. So I'm going to ask one more question now. I'm going to um, open it up. Um, but our very last speaker, Yannick, sort of summarised the sort of dilemma, I think, very, very well. Sort of idealistically wants to share data, but um, so I'm going to ask each panelist. Um, so I'm from a research funding organisation. We obviously support the idea of ensuring our researchers share the data which arises from uh, the funding we make available. But what could we specifically, what actions could a funder take to encourage the likes of Yannick? Perhaps we have to mandate him to do something, you know, sanctions and all that sort of thing. What can we do as a funder to try and encourage researchers not, you know, to, to share their data more openly? And I'll start, or should we start? Let's go around this way, Henry. Okay. Um, well, I've been promoting the concept that data is 
in computing science terms, well, I'm not sure it's an exact term, something called a first-class object. In other words, it should have equal status to the, the story that scientists and other researchers tell about their science, the narrative. So you have the narrative for which there is a 300-year infrastructure for um, curating it, getting credit for it, and getting promotions against it, and getting grants against it. Um, data hasn't had the same sort of champions, but I think it should be treated on an equal basis. Nowadays it can be cited on an equal basis. Nowadays it can have metadata on an equal basis. Um, and the data repository is a publisher of this. And so why not persuade the funders that for every young, you know, uh, early career researcher, we want them to generate not only the stories that they've told about their researchers, but to equally generate, um, let's say, DOIs for the data that they've generated to create those stories. So if, if that became treated on an equal basis by the funders, uh, by the heads of department, and by everybody else, these two aspects of the academic process should be treated equally. I think that will enormously boost the, the, sort of the, the, the credit that one gets and possibly also address the reciprocity issue which is that if you're not doing it, you know, you get, um, you don't get the grants quite so easily, you don't get the credit. So that, that's, that's my response to the, the funders. Okay, Pam, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, no, it's difficult to add anything to that. That was very <laughs> comprehensive. Um, so obviously it's about in, incentivising it um, in, in exactly this kind of way. So the encouragement is, and, and the idea that one should be doing that and one's part of a, a community and that if you don't show reciprocity and you're not playing your part in this, that somehow this will enter into your record as a, as a, um, a scientist and that somehow Welcome will learn of it and it will be used, used if not against <laughs> you. Well, it, it will be the opposite of the gold star I, I, I referenced earlier. The naughty corner. Yes, slightly, slightly naughty corner. However, I, I, I do feel there's got to be some effort to add some kind of, of, of metric to it. In, in, in the end, it's got to be more than sort of anecdotal. Uh, that you know, so and so is a jolly good, so jolly good character, and so and so isn't, because that would be open to um, all sorts of abuse. That's helpful. But Susanna, we've been we've been saying this for years. I've gone around the world saying. Yeah. This intrinsic value of what you publish, not where you publish, we want data to be available. And most people sort of hmm, give me a shrug and think, yeah, yeah, that's what you say, you don't mean it. What do we need to do more to demonstrate we mean this? Perhaps we need to wait for the next generation so we really train them. <laughs> and, you know, maybe put our open the next one. I think honestly, professionalize as well the 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 the, the work of making it a fair or you know that would really help because you will have the professionals and the researcher perhaps will not have the excuse, apologies, I'm researching myself, but sometimes we find the excuse, I don't have time. And just sometimes we don't have the time, we don't have the skill, it's not part of what we are supposed to do. Maybe if we were to hand over that task, that role to the professional, which are there, which are part of the, the research team, perhaps things will change. But this also means investing in creating that, you know, new profession and new workforce. Paula, any other way for the death strategy? Anything more immediate we can do? Well, I, I, I've written three things down here for different stakeholders, and I'll, I'll quickly run through them. If, if you're a, a research funder, I think you, you should be, a research funder should be um, much stricter about the requirements for how the data is. Um, made available for sharing and reuse as a condition of grant. I know there are many research funders recommend things, but they don't require them. If you look at publications, it's, it's a mandate rather than a recommendation. And while I quite understand when we're starting with uh, research data that the first stage of uh, engagement would be recommendations, I think those recommendations, it would be helpful if they move to requirements. The second thing is something universities can do, and something my university has done, and that is we've changed our promo academic promotions criteria. Uh, we're probably one of the first universities in Europe to do this, and um, the policy went out for consultation uh, a year ago, um, no, two years ago, and was, uh, was uh, adopted last year. 
And I put into the revised criteria, criteria about openness, not just for publications, but for data. Uh, and open source software, actually, or, or any other sort of output, uh, to, to show that these could be uh, criteria for reward and promotion in the, in the academic promotions framework. Um, it went out to consultation. I thought, oh, I bet I get a lot of kickback on this. I'm expecting quite a bit of uh, um, opposition to the idea that it's not just publications that matter. Uh, there was a fair bit of kickback uh, about the academic promotions um, uh, policy. It had nothing to do with openness, because I didn't get a single complaint about openness. It was all to do with job titles, what, what we call themselves. <laughs> anyway, that was resolved, happily resolved. So now it is part of UCL policy that openness does count for promotion. What we want to do next is to bring that into the appointments framework for new appointments. Uh, and also in the appraisal, the annual appraisal process. It's not yet in those processes, it is in the promotions framework, but that's the start. And for PhD students to graduate. Yes, fine, absolutely. Put it into the, um, into the early career researcher uh, um, profile as well. The third thing, uh, I think we've already mentioned, but I, I wonder whether we've got it right, and that is the role of the ref. Um, it, University, research universities are so dominated by publications because of the requirements of REF and the amount of money that that brings in that unless we give research data equal billing, not, you're not, afraid, not just your five star standard, but equal billing, it's not going to have equal exposure at, at university and international level. So I think there is another piece of work there around REF requirements. Well, thank you for that. Really, really clear recommendations. Let me open this up to the audience. You've got a panel of experts here. Are there any questions you'd like to know? Yes. I, I just wanted to say I completely agree. The ref has to change. Okay. At my institution, they're very clear on how they choose what goes into the ref. And I worry that, you know, despite the fact we're talking about making data, you know, a first class citizen in its own right, there's not enough examples of this being taken seriously. So I think, you know, it's great to see UCL taking a lead. And, and putting this into practice, but we need to see more of these high profile cases um, where people are actually getting their data put forward as a rough return. I don't think we'll see it. This, I, I'm cynical enough to think, I just don't think we're, we're going to see it this time around. This time around. But I think there's you know, every opportunity to, to seize the momentum and try to make sure that this goes into the next draft. Yeah. Um, on, a, on a sort of slightly sort of low level note, in the last three years, something like 15 of the publications which will be eligible for the REF have been clearly published with two DOIs. Um, the first is for the article and the second is for its data. And it's my hope that when the REF submission is made um, that uh, those data DOIs will be preserved in the submission so that whoever looks at them will recognize that there is data that is, in, in this particular case, open as well as fair, associated with the REF. Um, that's, as you say, not obligatory, um, but we've tried to seed it by creating at least a small corpus of publications with, uh, which are linked at the hip, that's the phrase I used earlier, to data. Uh, and maybe the people who read it will notice that and ask for it in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, as data becomes more open, it becomes more open to misuse, and I wonder if you had any comments on whether we're doing enough to regulate it and the data ethics side of things. Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hot data. <laughs> well, um, misuse. Uh, sorry, I just grabbed the no, no, the, no, the no, microphone. Carry on, carry on. Um, one of the aspects of fair data, uh, which is associated with the metadata, is it has a very clear date stamp. And so one of the ways you can detect unethical behavior um, is if data that's already been date stamped with a certain date <coughs> then suddenly appears with a different provenance maybe three years later. Now you can almost always detect um, reused data which, you know, accurate to the fifth death, decimal place in a number or something, it could not have arisen by accident. So um, the date stamp is one of the ways in which you try to, you know, make sure that ethical behavior is promoted. 
Um, but on the other hand, you do want people to use it. So if they use the data, they clearly cite it, then that's good. But if they use the data, but they don't cite it, that's bad. And of course, there's a whole spectrum in between. And it is a very difficult topic as to how you'll police it and regulate it. And I don't know whether you have any other brilliant ideas on how to cope. Panel. Only as a general uh, principle, I'd say that uh, fraud is easier to detect if everything is available and open uh, to scrutiny and uh, to try to reproduce the results. And um, if, if openness is going to be the defining feature of our new research landscape going forward, it has to be self-regulating. Uh, and to, in order for it uh, to do that, uh, uh, to, to get this um, level of confidence in uh, the use of the data that, it, that is being made uh, available, uh, if everything is open, it's much easier to detect when it's being misused. That, that, that's my best answer at the moment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions out there? Sorry, over here. I couldn't, I couldn't see you. <laughs> um, I was wondering for the communities that are less mature in their use of data and being open, um, like biology and other, um, how would you help suggest to, like, to help support those disciplines develop the metadata and the practices and what can they learn, or how, how can they learn from the communities that are more mature in this? I actually wanted, that it's a helpful question because I wanted to pick up on something you were talking about before, how UCL started to change its uh, promotions policies and employment policies and all the rest of it, because that must go alongside supporting um, your academics to be able to um, sure. get involved in, in uh, fair data and publication of fair data. So I think that, uh, on the one hand to have the incentives that say this is going to be part of your promotion criteria is, is a great thing to set up, but then how exactly does one then ensure that every community has equal access to being able to do that? So what we tried to do in my institution, we have a, a, an open science platform which uh, I uh, co-chair which looks across all the areas of open science as defined by the Commission, the, the, I think it's eight pillars of open science that the European Commission has defined. And one of them is about training and skills, one of the areas. Uh, one of the early um, wins we, uh, we, we think we've identified in um, uh, UCL is to work with our doctoral school, our, our, our PhD students. But David Bogle, who's my colleague as a pro vice provost in uh, the research area, uh, it looks after the doctoral school as I look after the, 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 the library. And David wanted very early on UCL to be an example of uh, open science is not the exception, it's the norm. So everyone who comes in to do a PhD, we have, uh, we issue about 500, 750 PhDs a year. Every student who comes in is trained in open approaches as the norm, not as an exception. So they go out, if they adopt an academic career at the end of their uh, doctoral studies, they are trained as open scientists and they will adopt naturally open uh, uh, approaches. So the library has developed a series of training events and training courses as part of the doctoral school programme to make open the, the, the norm in all subject areas, in all 11 schools where we um, offer PhD programmes. And we will scale up from that then to look at more established researchers who might be slightly hard nuts to crack in changing the way they work. And uh, there's a question at the back there. Can I just Sorry. add that we're also partners with the SSI and the Carpentries so we roll out a normal lot of workshops on doing computational science as if we ran a workshop last week. Just add to Paul's comment. Um, I'll tell you a story in my capacity as a PhD examiner. And I travelled to a well-known university that shall be nameless, and that's why I accidentally mention it, which is always possible. Um, and before I turned up for the examination, I asked the internal examiner whether they could provide some data associated with a PhD for me to peruse before the exam. Now, this was not obligatory on my part. Um, it brought a slightly traumatised response from the internal examiner. 
It was said I could have a little data, but I certainly couldn't have it all because that would be far too onerous a burden to place on the PhD student at short notice. Um, so I could have some selected data associated with the thesis, which I did examine, uh, and it was incorporated into the Viva. But I, I always wondered if I'd really insisted on having all of the data for all of the chapters, quite what, if, what, what would have happened. I suspect I wouldn't have been invited back as an examiner <laughs> to this august institution. Um, but certainly um, there was no way for me to easily report back my findings about the data to the university registry, um, who wouldn't have been interested. Um, so it was really just a, a lesson for the PhD student and the internal examiner to absorb the next time they invited me. Thank you. <clears throat> and final question. Uh, I, I, this is something, Suzanne, actually, uh, as a bit of a practical one, you were talking about a lot of tools available for checking if your data is fair or uh, if your approach is a uh, semi-quantitative method. I'm actually quite interested. Are you aware of any such as semi-quantitative uh, approaches to test if your research is reproducible? Like, are, are there like a set of guidelines or less Well, not directly. So uh -huh. let me also clarify that a lot of tools are being developed to to assess the, you know, the, the, the fairness of, of certain data sets. Well, uh, the, the, the final um, uh, R in FAIR stands for reuse, where actually reproduce, it's, it's, it's one of the reuse you could have. So potentially, if your data is sufficiently fair for you to actually redo and reproduce, then, then you know, that would work, the, the same concept apply. But like I say, the tools are being developed. Okay. Yeah, I would like to have a Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So let me let me let me close by. Let me ask just each of you one 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 final question. Um, so obviously we're we've come to this, so we're pretty much signed up to the, the FAIR principles. We're we're part of the advanced gang, if you like. But there is still skepticism out there, there's still a sense of, oh, it's a lot of work, no one really wants to use my data, I'd much rather go and do something new. So Assume I am that, that cynic, what advice would you give to me to actually encourage me to, to join this open, um, fair um, movement? Paul. Well, I can uh, repeat a little story from my uh, institution. I said historians were, I'm going to pretend no historian now for it, um, I said historians were a little, perhaps not uh, always at the front of the queue when it comes to talking about open data. So I talked to a history professor in um, UCL. So we published a book and I said, fantastic uh, to see your book. Thank you so much for publishing it on, on European um, history. Um, pity it's not open access, but anyway, it's good, good, good to see the book. Did, did you ever think about making the data available as well so we could see not only your conclusions, uh, but the, the building blocks, the data on which you've built your conclusion, so we can try and reproduce whether you know, that your, your conclusions are sound. I don't think I used the word sound, but that's what, that's what I meant. Um, he said no, he had thought, think for a minute, said no, 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 I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to make the data available. So I said, oh, that's a pity, uh, may I ask what, why, why aren't you going to do that? Um, which is your, your position in this uh, pretend argument. He said, well, if I make the data available, people will read it. And that means they might come to a different conclusion from what I've come to in my book. Uh, and that wouldn't be very good. And I said, well, isn't that what research is about? <laughs> this is about being open to new ideas and sharing the outcomes. So I would say to you, the culture's got to change because with respect, the, the, the position where you're not sharing everything just isn't good for the research. Excellent anecdote. Susanna? I don't have an anecdote, but uh, I think that the critical mass is there. Many researchers understand they cannot work anymore within their own lab. That they, they need other people's data. And if they don't want to share their own data, I think other people will use other people's data and they will be cut off from collaboration and to, you know, to move forward. I think it's science is collaborative and you are out if you're not in. So I think I'm a little in, in the same vein in that I was thinking that uh, what I would say is that you become a better scientist by making your data 
fair and, and having responses to it. I mean, the best reviews and most useful reviews I've had for papers are in the journal where the data has been made available as, as part of the publication in this case, and the referee has been able to come back and, and, and really comment in detail about how I drew my conclusions from, from, from the data that I had. And I, I think it, it, it opens one's mind, and it, it opens the whole intellect to um, scientific advance as, as an individual and collectively. So I think that there is, a, it, there is a case that can be made, and I think it's great to start with, with PhD students, and the PhD students that, that can hopefully help to educate the, the crusty 50-something <laughs> who are less, less open to this world. Henry, I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm not telling you how old I am. <laughs> I'm not going to ask. No. <laughs> or even guess. No. Um, well, can you bear one more anecdote from the panel then? I suppose a, a final anecdote possibly. Um, about nine years ago, I collaborated with a colleague uh, on a piece of research. He made the molecules, and I computed data for them. And off it went, and um, it had fair data attached to it. Um, and then eight years went by, and then a slightly traumatised colleague appeared in my office one day and said, um, our findings from nine years ago have been questioned. Um, another group has got a different result from us. Um, and now they're essentially published a paper which says, we got it wrong nine years ago, and this is the right answer. So you're not quite traumatised because this is the worst thing that can happen to a researcher, as you say, is to be accused of getting it wrong. So I thought, well, we're going to have to reopen this nine-year-old project, which I'd forgotten about completely. Fortunately, because all the fair data was there, um, I was able to reopen it and, in fact, work out what the divergence was. The answer, by the way, is that we were both right. So <laughs> no one lost any face. But no, the project was reopened within two hours. I remember thinking, um, I'm now running with this new project two hours after my colleague walked into my office. And within two or three days, we fully understood um, why two different groups had come up with different answers. Um, and it was quite a subtle one, and I'm not going to bore you, but both people were right, or both groups were right. And, um, and science had moved on. But, but had, had we not created the fair data, um, nine years earlier, it would have been very difficult. It would take a month, or maybe two months, to, you know, to actually remember what was happening and to compare it and reproduce it and so on. So although, in this particular case, the reuse was of our own fair data, I think it illustrates, you know, the advantages of doing it. Brilliant, thank you. So if I, if I turn it into a soundbite, I think making data fair is not only the, it's not only the, the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do for science. Yeah. So uh, thank you for that. I think we're now we've got drinks and networking. Tea and some biscuits. Tea and biscuits. Drinks. <laughs> I was led to believe you got drinks. So, <laughs> <interesting. Yeah. laughs> so let me let me just ask you all to thank our illustrious panel. Thank you.